On today's episode... Yes, young man, what can I do for you this morning? Well, sir, I'm here to de-witch the princess. Well, you're going to have to pass four tests. All kinds of tales. From all kinds of tellers. Here on The Appleseed. It's time for The Appleseed. In each episode of the show, we bring you stories from favorite storytellers. Stories to entertain you and inspire you. They'll get you thinking and even help your family tell your own stories. I'm Sam Payne. And today we have a story from Philadelphia storyteller Ed Stivender. It's his take on a very old story of which there are many versions. Some people call the story Jack and the Magic Ship. Some people call it the Ship of Fools. Well, you'll remember Jack, of course, the character at the center of the story, the Appalachian trickster of Jack and the Beanstalk fame. Well, Jack is at the center of all kinds of stories, and he's a simple character whose wit and luck put him on on top of things, usually in spite of it all. Well, today we take you on this adventure with Jack, one where he needs a little help getting out of a heap of trouble. Have you ever felt like you weren't the favorite? Then this may be a story for you. Have you ever had to face a formidable bully or a big challenge? Then this might be a story for you. Have you ever experienced the power of teamwork? then this is a story for you. Here's Ed Stivender with a story he calls Jack and the Magic Boat, recorded live in the Appleseed studio. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're going to stay in um, the American folk tradition for now. Um, And um, in the North Carolina folk tradition, there's a Jack tale about... uh, the time that uh, Jack and his uh, two brothers, Will and Tom, tried to dewitch a princess. One morning, Jack and his brother Will and his brother Tom were sitting around the breakfast table, and Jack said, pass me the milk, please. They passed the milk to Jack. He looked on the side of a milk carton. There was a picture of a young girl with a crown on her head. Above the picture, it said, princess has been kidnapped by an evil wizard, cast under a spell, taken into the woods, $1,000 reward for him who can find the princess and break the spell. And then there was a toll-free 1-800 number under that. (laughs) And Will, he was the oldest brother, said, Mama, I'd like to go out and de-witch that princess. Can you pack me a lunch? So they packed for him a nice roast chicken, nice chocolate cake, quart of milk, put it in a satchel, sent him on his way. He got about halfway to the wizard's house when he figured he'd sit down and have his lunch. He was just about to start eating when an old woman with a staff in her hand came down the road and said to Will, Can you share some of your meal, Sonny? Will looked up at the old woman and said, No way, old lady. I only have enough for myself. You're going to have to find your meal somewhere else today. Get on out of here. The old woman continued on her way. Will finished what he could, but he wasted a lot of it, just threw it into the woods, headed on toward the wizard's house. He got to the wizard's front door, knocked on it. No answer. All of a sudden, he hurried behind him. Yes, young man, what can I do for you this morning? Will turned around, and there was that evil wizard standing in the yard. Will said, well, sir, said Will, I'm here to de-witch the princess. Well, if you want to de-witch the princess, you're going to have to pass four tests. And this is the first one. The wizard brought out a hackle. Hackle is a board about a foot square with nails sticking up out of it. People used to beat flax on hackles to make linen. Put the hackle on the ground with the nails pointing up. Then the wizard stood on a stump, jumped into the air, came down head first on the nails, popped off without a scratch on him. Your turn. (laughs) Will got up on that stump, looked down at them nails, closed his eyes, leaned forward. Oh, my head, my head. He ran home with the blood streaming down his face. He got home. His mama fixed up his head with vinegar and brown paper, and he was in bed for three weeks. Now, the next day, it was Tom's turn. Tom's mama packed for him a nice roast chicken, nice chocolate cake, quart of milk, put it in a satchel, sent him on his way. He got about halfway to the wizard's house when he figured he'd sit down and have his lunch. Just about to start eating, when an old woman with a staff in her hand came down the road and said to Tom, Can you share some of your meal, Sonny? Tom looked up at the old woman and said, No way, old lady. only have enough for myself. You're going to have to find your meal somewhere else today. Get on out of here. The old woman continued on her way. Tom finished what he could, but he wasted a lot of it, just threw it into the woods, headed on toward the wizard's house, got to the wizard's front door, knocked on it. 
No answer. All of a sudden, you heard behind him, Yes, young man, what can I do for you this morning? Well, sir, said Tom to the evil wizard standing in the yard, I'm here to uh, dewitch the princess. Well, if you want to dewitch the princess, we're going to have to pass four tests. This is the first one. The wizard brought out Hackle, the board with them nails sticking up, put the Hackle on the ground, stored on a stump, jumped into the air, came down head first on the Hackle, popped off without a scratch on him. Your turn. Tom got up on that stump, looked down at them nails, closed his eyes, leaned forward. Oh, my head, my head. He ran home with the blood streaming down his face. He got home. His mama fixed up his head with vinegar and brown paper. He was in bed for three weeks. Well, the next day was Jack's turn. Now, Jack wasn't really the favorite of the family. People used to think he was a little bit on the fooler's side, always telling stories and everything. Plus, they were running out of chicken and chocolate cake. <laughs> so all he got for lunch? Two dry pieces of bread and a quart of tap water. Put in a satchel, sent him on his way. He got about halfway to the wizard's house, figured he'd sit down and have his lunch. Just about start eating. When? An old woman with a staff in her hand came down the road, said to Jack, Can you share some of your meal, sonny? Jack looked up at the old woman. What do you think Jack said? Yes, ma'am, have a seat. Old woman sat down. Jack gave her one of the dry pieces of bread, about half the tap water. When they were finished their lunch, the old woman said to Jack, I can see you're an upstanding young man, Jack. I've got a present for you. She reached into her pocket, pulled out a piece of bark, you know, bark from a tree, handed that piece of bark to Jack and said, That there is a piece of magic bark. All you got to do is hold it up and say, Sail, ship, sail. Piece of magic bark will take you wherever you want to go. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. Jack said, thank you, young lady. And the, young, the old woman said, you're welcome, Jack. <laughs> and they separated. The old woman went her way. Jack went his way towards the wizard's house. But before we got there, he figured he'd try out this piece of magic bark, see if it really worked. Held it up and said, Sail, ship, sail. All of a sudden, that piece of magic bark began to expand and expand and expand till there, floating in the air in front of Jack, was a 35-foot sailing sloop with a mast reaching into the sky and sails a-flapping. There was an anchor chain came out of it with an anchor hooked onto a root. Jack got into the magic boat, pulled in the anchor chain, said, sail, ship, sail. That boat took off up and up and up and up. Well, pretty soon, Jack could see all over the countryside. He saw his mama's house over on one side, saw that wizard's house over on the other side, but he figured he'd take a ride around. As he was riding, he heard a sound coming from down below, something like this. <laughs> Looked over the side of the boat. There about down below was a fella running so fast, butting his head into trees so hard that all the leaves would shake off. <laughs> Jack yelled down to the fella, hey fella, what's your name? My name is Hardy Hardhead. What's yours? My name is Jack. You want to come on my boat? I'd love to. So Hardy Hardhead got on the boat and they took it up and up and up and up. After a while, Jack heard another sound. It went like this. Jack looked over the side of the boat, and there down below was a fella running through a pasture, stopping at ponds and drinking the ponds dry in one gulp. <laughs> Jack yelled down to the fella, Hey, fella, what's your name? My name is Drinkwell. <laughs> what's yours? My name is Jack. Want to come on my boat? I'd love to. So Drinkwell got on the boat, and they took it up and up and up and up and up. After a while, they heard another sound. It went like this. <laughs> 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 Jack looked over the side of the boat, and there down below was a fellow running through a pasture, chasing sheep, catching the sheep, eating them whole. <laughs> Jack yelled down to the fella, Hey, fella, what's your name? My name is Eatwell. What's yours? <laughs> my name is Jack. Want to come on my boat? I'd love to. So we will get on the boat, and they took it up and up and up and up and up. After a while, everything got real quiet. People in the audience were trying to figure out where the heroic women were. <laughs> Jack looked over the side of the boat, and there down below were three young women. One of them was standing there with her hands cupped behind her ears. One of them was standing there with her hands 
over her eyes. One of them was standing there with her hands cupped around her nose. Jack said to the first young woman, Hey, young woman, what do you hear? I hear a monarch butterfly caterpillar chewing on a milkweed leaf 1,000 miles away. That's pretty good, young woman. What's your name? My name is Herewell. What's yours? My name's Jack. Want to come on my boat? I'd love to. Here, we'll get on the boat. Young woman who was shading her eyes with her hands, Jack said to her, Hey, young woman, what do you see? I see a raven coming down to eat a monarch butterfly caterpillar <laughs> chewing on a milkweed leaf 1,000 miles away. Yeah, that's pretty good, young one. What's your name? My name is Seawell. What's yours? My name's Jack. Want to come on my boat? I'd love to. See, we'll get on the boat. Young woman standing there with her hands cupped around her nose. Jack said to her, young woman, what do you smell? I smell raven's vomit. <laughs> 1,000 miles away. Them monarch butterfly caterpillars are poisonous, you know. <clears throat> so I heard, said Jack, what's your name? My name is Smellwell. What's yours? My name's Jack. You want to come on my boat? I'd love to. Smellwell get on the boat. They were about to take the boat up when they heard twang, zing. They looked over, and there was a fellow with a bow, just shot an arrow. Jack said to him, hey, fella, what'd you just do? Well, I reckon I just put a raven out of his misery. <laughs> 1,000 miles away. <laughs> That's pretty good, young man. What's your name? My name is Shootwell. What's yours? My name's Jack. You want to come on my boat? I'd love to. So shoot, we'll get on the boat. They're about to take the boat up when they heard, Yum. Jack looked over. All he could see was a gray blur. Realized it was a young woman running so fast you could hardly even see her. Jack called out, hey, young woman, hold on. What's your name? My name is Judy. <laughs> but my friends on the track team call me Runwell. <laughs> What's yours? My name's Jack. Want to come on my boat? I'd love to. Runwell got on the boat, and they took it up and up and up and up. Well, after a while, Jack figured it was about time to go see that wizard. So he called out, hard of below which is only a command you can give in your sail if your sailboat is floating in the air. <laughs> sailboat came down and down and down, sailed in the air in front of the wizard's house. Jack jumped out of the boat, walked over to the front door, knocked on it. No answer. All of a sudden, he heard behind him, Yes, young man, what can I do for you this morning? Well, sir, said Jack, <clears throat> I'm here to um, de-witch the princess, me and my friends. Well... If you want to de-witch the princess, you're going to have to pass four tests. This is the first one. The wizard brought out the hackle on the board with them nails sticking up, put the hackle on the ground, stood on a stump, jumped into the air, came down head first on the nails, popped off without a scratch on it. Your turn. Well, sir, said Jack, I'd like one of my friends to try that. Oh, yeah? Which one of your friends? My friend, Hardy Hardhead. Hardy hearted, get out of the boat, walked over to the stump, stood on the stump, jumped into the air, flipped around three times, came down so hard on the hackle, broke the hackle into a thousand pieces. Hey, Jack, can I borrow your comb? Well, sure, Hardy. <laughs> All right, so you pass one of the four tests. But there's still three more to go. And if you fail any of these tests, I get to slit your throats from ear to ear and suck out your brains. Did I mention he was an evil wizard? <laughs> Is it agreed? Yes, sir, said Jack. Yes, sir, said the gang of the boat. All right, you got anybody that likes to drink? Well, said Jack, none of my friends drink alcohol, but my friend Drinkwell loves water. Drinkwell got out of the boat. The wizard pointed to a creek at Drinkwell's feet and said, All right, Drinkwell, it'll be your creek there. This creek here, this will be my creek. I'll race you to see you can drink their creek dry first. If you win... You pass two of the four tests. But if I win, I get to slit your throat from ear to ear and suck out your brains on the count of three. One, two, two and a half, two and three quarters, two and seven eighths, two and fifteen sixteenths, two and thirty one thirty seconds, two and sixty three sixty fourths. Later on, when Jack would take his college boards, his SAT, 
He remembered this arithmetic progression, and he got a real good score on his math portion. <clears throat> Two and 125, 127, 128 ths Two and 255, 256s. Three! Oh. And the wizard began to drink. But before he was half finished, Drinkwell had finished his whole creek and was beginning to drink from the headwaters of the wizard. All right! So you passed two of the four tests. But there's still two more to go. You got anybody that likes to eat? Well, as a matter of fact, um, said Jack, my friend Eatwell loves to eat. Eatwell, get out of the boat. The wizard disappeared behind his house, dragged out by the horns, two prize-winning cows. And one of them cows to Eatwell held the other himself and said, here's the deal, Eatwell. I'll race you to see who can finish their cow first. If you win, you pass three of the four tests. But if I win, I get to slit your throats from ear to ear and suck out your brains. On the count of... Three, one, two, 2, 2.5, 2.6, 2.7, 2.8, 2.9, 2.9999, 2.9999, 2.9999, 3. And the wizard began to eat, but before he was half finished, eat well if it had finished his whole count, said, you got anything for dessert, sir? All right. So you pass three of the four tests, but there's still one more to go. You got anybody that likes to run? Well, as a matter of fact, said Jack, my friend Runwell loves to run. Judy, get out of the boat. <laughs> the wizard took an egg, broke the egg, and let the yolk fall on the ground, handed half the eggshell to Runwell, held the other half himself, and said, here's the deal, Runwell. I'll race you from here to the Pacific Ocean and back. They were in North Carolina at the time. 3,000 miles up, 3,000 miles back. You take your eggshell, fill it with salt water to prove that you've been there. If you win, we'll dewitch that princess. But if I win, I get to slit your throat from ear to ear and suck out your brains. On the count of three. Three! <laughs> what a cheater. He took off. Run well. Passed him. Got to the Pacific Ocean, filled her eggshell with salt water, was on her way back when the wizard met her coming halfway. The wizard knew he was going to have to pull another dirty trick. Reached into his pocket, pulled out a bottle of chloroform, a chemical that makes you go to sleep, say no to drugs. Out of his other pocket, he pulled a handkerchief, put the chloroform on the handkerchief, and as Runwell ran past, covered her mouth and nose with that handkerchief so that she fell asleep right on her feet. She lay down on the ground. The wizard left that handkerchief on her mouth and nose, sped on to the Pacific Ocean, knowing that Runwell would never wake up. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, Jack and the gang were getting worried. Jack's here well. Jack says, here well. What do you hear? Uh, I hear snoring, Jack. 1,500 miles away. Smell well. What do you smell? Ah, uh, I smell chloroform, Jack, 1,500 miles away. See, well, what do you see? Oh, no, it looks like Runwell is sleeping on the job, Jack. Got a handkerchief covering her mouth and nose. She's never going to wake up. Well, gang, I guess we're goners. Not necessarily, says Shootwell, as he steps out of the boat, raises his bow, takes an arrow out of his quiver, notches it up. Twang, zing! The arrow travels 1,500 miles, hits the handkerchief off the mouth and nose of Runwell. She gets fresh air. She looks around, sees that her eggshell is empty, has to go back to the Pacific Ocean to refill it. Meanwhile, here comes that wizard. He's coming on strong. He's about 300 yards from the finish line. Wait, there's Runwell on the horizon. Pretty soon, they're neck and neck, nose and nose, with her last ounce of energy. Runwell bursts over the finish line and wins the race. Oh, I hate it when the good guys win. <laughs> good guys, says Runwell. Oh, good gals, good persons. Whatever it is. Come on around back. I'll show you where the princess is. They went around back, and there was a shed there. The wizard opened the shed door, and there, staring into space, was a young girl with a crown on her head, saying, B-A-T spells cat. C-A-T spells rat. Yeah, that's a spell, all right, says Jack. That is a bad spell. 
Oh, right. <laughs> Abracadabra, the spell is lifted. Get on back to your classroom for the gifted. And the princess came to her senses. <laughs> Walked out of the shed. Jack and the gang asked her if she wanted to ride on the boat. She said she did. They took her down to the castle where she lived with her mom and dad. The king and queen ran out, hugged the princess, gave Jack and the gang a thousand dollars. And they spent the rest of that day just wandering over the countryside, trying to figure out how they could invest that thousand dollars to ensure that they would live happily ever after. <laughs> <laughs> Ed Stivender with Jack and the Magic Boat, a story of which there are many versions, old and new, and we love that one. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. I bet as you listened, some stories sprang to mind for you from your own life or the life of someone you know. Stories have this wonderful way of sprouting like seeds and growing as the stories bring up thoughts that grow into conversations. Maybe that's why we call the show The Apple Seed. One of those conversations coming up in just a moment. I'm Sam Payne. It's such a pleasure for me to be with you on today's episode of The Apple Seed. You know, as I was listening to Ed Stivender tell that terrific story, it brought back a memory for me. I was a young father of three little boys, and, well, it was inevitable that one of them would want to play a team sport. It was the middle boy. He was six, and he wanted, wanted, wanted to be on a soccer team in the local little kid's soccer league. He wanted to be on the soccer team partly because one of his neighborhood pals was on the team. Also, he was going to get to wear a cool soccer jersey, right? Well, me, I have to admit right up front that I knew nothing about soccer. But it sounded like a blast and a good way for the boy to get some summer exercise. So I shrugged my shoulders and imagined a summer of sitting on the sidelines in a camp chair, cheering the child on or kicking a soccer ball around in the backyard together. I mean, after I bought a soccer ball, that is. I imagined bringing orange slices for halftime snacks when it was my turn. And, well, it seemed like there were a lot of worse ways to spend a summer. So I shrugged and said, sure, why not? sign the six-year-old up for the team. And we did. And we waited for word, a phone call or email that would let us know when practices might start up and when the games were. We went to the sporting goods store and bought a pair of tiny shin guards and a pair of tiny soccer cleats and a ball. And we waited. And no information came. And we finally began to get a little concerned that the league might have, oh, I don't know, the wrong contact information or something. So I called the phone number on the sign-up sheet that we still had stuck to the fridge, ring, ring, and then a voice on the other end. And the question from me, we haven't gotten any information yet, and we're wondering if maybe we could find out about practices and games and so forth. Can you tell me anything about that? And on the other end of the phone, the voice says, yeah, about that. We had a lot of interest on the part of a whole bunch of kids to play soccer in this league, but we didn't get quite as much interest from folks who wanted to be coaches. And since I've got you on the phone, Mr. Payne, is it? I'm wondering if you might be interested in... Well, I knew where the voice was going with this. And, well, I knew nothing about soccer. Did I mention that? But I'm also the guy who says, well, even though I don't have a single aptitude for this, if I say no, the voice on the phone is just going to call some other mom or dad and ask them to coach the team. And why should that mom or dad be blindsided by a coaching gig just because I said no? It hardly seems fair to them. So I probably ought to say yes. I mean, I'm totally that guy. So I shrugged and said, sure, why not? Sign me up as coach. I mean, I was going to be at the games anyway, right? My word, what a summer. Almost immediately, we had to choose a name for our soccer team, my job. And we had a brainstorming session and a vote with this whole gaggle of six-year-olds. And the winning name, the Thunderbolts, left some kids in tears because we weren't the Orange Dragons, the name that came in second place. So there was that diplomacy in which to engage. And then there were parents who wanted to see a certain defense implemented on the field and wanted their kid to play a certain role in that defense. And then there were family vacations for one kid or another, which meant we'd be a player or two or three 
three down in such and such a practice or game. And then there was the organization of the phone tree in case information needed to be delivered to the families of the players. And then there was the assigning of the bringing of orange slices and making sure you had a backup plan if such and such a kid's mom or dad forgot to bring the orange slices because for heaven's sake, you can't have a soccer game without orange slices. And that's not even to mention the highs and lows of the games themselves where my job became cheerleader and comforter and therapist. And did I mention that I don't know anything about soccer? I mean, my word, what a summer. And it all began with, sure, why not? Sign me up as coach. Well, that memory came back to me when I heard Ed's story about how Jack, in essence, said, sure, why not? Sign me up. I'll go disenchant the princess. We enter into what will become the biggest ventures of our lives with a degree of nonchalance and naivete that is, well, it's terrifying to think about. Marriage, careers, schooling. It seems we so often fail to enter any of those things with the preparation that perhaps they deserve. So how do we get through any of it? Well, in that summer of soccer, you ought to know, that the dad of my son's friend, you know, the friend that was the reason my son wanted to be on the team in the first place? Well, that dad stepped up to be assistant coach. One of the Thunderbolt parents signed up to organize the orange slices. Another parent found us a great place, an enormous expanse of grass and shade where we could practice. I often sat down in the living room that summer with a neighbor, not associated with the league at all, a big soccer fan, who taught me the basics. And, of course, there was the energy coming from each one of those wonderful kids. My thunderbolts. What a summer. Sometimes I don't know how we make it through some of the big things we enter into, but I do know that, just like Jack in Ed Stivender's story, we don't make it through alone. So as for the next big adventure, whatever that is, sure, why not? Sign me up and come along, won't you? Thanks for joining us today on The Apple Seed, and thanks to Ed Stivender for sharing his story. Listening to these stories always brings up memories for me that I love to share. Where do the stories take you, and who will you take along? Our episode today was produced by Brian Tanner, Heather Bigley, and Wendy Folsom. Our audio engineers are Carly Wilson and Ashton Parkinson. Trent Horton and Evie Hendricks make up the rest of the Appleseed team. If you want to send us a note, you can. Email us at theappleseed at byu.edu. That's theappleseed, all one word, at byu.edu. Or if you're listening through a podcast app, rate us. Leave us a little review. It helps people find the show and, of course, Course, we love to hear from you. We're pleased and proud to be among the many shows in the BYU Radio family of programs. And you can find this episode or any episode from our archive on the BYU Radio app at byuradio.org slash Appleseed or by Googling the Appleseed podcast. I'm Sam Payne, and I can't wait to be with you again on the Appleseed. Appleseed.